you are in for an awesome treat. He is a renaissance man. He is a man who has mastered the four keys of success. The first key of success that David has mastered is the key of faith. He's successful because he is a family man. He has mastered the art of finance, but most importantly, the principle of friendship. So I present to you today the speaker for this great occasion, the one, the only, my friend, my brother, doctor for the day, Dr. David Cordes. Good morning. When Wayne called me a few weeks ago or a month ago and said, who would you like to introduce you? And we can get you anybody you want in the state. It took me about a second and a half and I said, Reverend Reed. Reverend Reed has been, as he indicated, a friend, a deep friend of mine, my wife's and the Cordish family for many, many years. And he is our spiritual leader. When we have a problem in the Cordish family, when we have a loved one, when whatever it is that I need counseling on, we go to Reverend Reed and we get the best possible help and love. So it was an easy answer for me. Who would I like to introduce me? Thank you, Frank. It is truly an honor and a privilege for me to be speaking today and have to have received the award that I did earlier on my behalf and on behalf of the Cordish Company. I have been blessed in the last year especially with an un unusual number of awards that I don't deserve and I humbly accept them. But this one is very special and I am truly honored to accept the award today and to be the principal speaker. To understand um, maybe why the award was given to the Cordish Company today and why I'm up here, I need to go back in time and put it in context. I was a 16-year-old junior at Baltimore City College. I had hitchhiked to school for the first day of class, as I always did, and that maybe gives you a little bit of context of how things were different back then when my parents thought nothing of the fact that I hitchhiked to school every day. And as I walked up the hill to the castle on the hill, Something very strange, I was always late because if you're hitchhiking, you never know exactly when you're gonna get there. And usually I would be running at the, at the last minute right before nine and there wouldn't be anybody gathered outside because everybody would already be in school. But there were hundreds of people, hundreds, gathered around milling, young kids, and I thought that was strange. And as I walked up these steep steps to the hill, I saw that I didn't recognize them. These were students from another high school, Mervo Technical School, down the street about four blocks from City College. And some of them had signs and some of them had other things they were waving and they were shouting, don't go in school, don't go in. I remember this was the first day. And what they were trying to do, this was right after Brown versus Board of Education, the integration of the public schools in the United States and they were trying to tell us, don't go into school, don't obey the law, don't integrate. And I kept walking, and I went into class, and I noticed everybody in my classroom was there. As I walked down the halls, everybody else in their classrooms were in their seats. And then over the loudspeaker, the principal's voice came booming. And normally, whenever the principal gave a citywide uh, announcement, you were worried something was wrong. But in this case, he said, would everybody please report to the auditorium? We all left our homerooms, walked to the auditorium. The auditorium was packed. There wasn't anybody missing. Principal got up on the stage and he said, men of City College, I'm proud of you. And I've never forgotten that day. That was the beginning of integration in the public schools. There was never a problem. We went about our business. 
The next thing that happened to me that sticks in my mind as vividly as the first incident I've just described is I moved from City College to Johns Hopkins University. One of my best friends was, believe it or not, a rival from Poly. You wouldn't think he would be one of my best friends, but it just happened that way. They're really not bad people who, uh, who went to Poly. I thought they were when I was at City, but I learned different. This man's name was Victor Dates. He happened to be an African-American, and we became very close friends. We played on the freshman football team together. We played four years of lacrosse together. We partied together. Uh, we did some things together I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but we became good friends, and we were both courting very serious women, much more serious than we were. Uh, and we would double date an awful lot. And to show the women that we were serious, we quite often went to the, the theater downtown, we went to the Lyric, and we showed them that we were cultural. Well, that was fine, uh, and it seemed to work. But the point of this story really is what happened after the theater. And we would want to go out to eat or to have a drink at a restaurant, and there was none that would allow Victor Dates to come in. It's indescribable to me to tell you the feeling that would well up. This continued on through my junior year, and then people much bigger and smarter and brighter and more courageous than me started to take their, this matter into their own hands nationally. And of course, I'm talking about Reverend King and people like him. We did our bit, and the Blue Jay restaurant on St. Paul Street, we would start to pick it and encourage, and eventually, by my senior year, the walls had come tumbling down. But these are the kind of things that stay with you. You don't forget the humiliation. I grew up a block from Drude Hill Park, and Drude Hill Park, that's where I played ball. One of the things I did, I played a little bit of tennis. And in those days, the tennis courts were tennis courts for whites, tennis courts for blacks, not very far apart, in Drude Hill Park. It's hard to believe today. Not too many years later, when a young man named Arthur Ashe came up from Richmond to play, the parks had finally been completely integrated, and he beat everybody 5, 10, and 15 years older than him of all races. And you start to understand what America's all about. My dad used to say to me, my dad worked with us till he was 93 years old. America does not have an aristocracy. America has the aristocracy of achievement and of merit. Now, that stuck with me. Flash forward to today and in recent times when I have the very, very privileged honor of leading the Cordish Company and doing something with these members the learning that I had in these experiences. And we've tried to, uh, in our little way, be completely inclusive in everything we do. There's six partners at the Cordish Company, full partners. One of them's here today, happens to be an African American. His name is Zed Smith. Zed, can you stand up for one second just so everybody can recognize you? I can tell you, when I go to the major conferences of real estate developers in this country, and you will see as many as 20 and 25,000 people, International Council of Shopping Centers, it's not a very integrated place, and you don't have minorities as partners, and it's got to change. And we're going to do our part. We're building a casino in Anne Arundel County. Some of you may have heard about question A. It's the third largest casino that will be when we open, we're under construction, in the United States. It's larger than anything in Las Vegas or in Atlantic City. We have a general contractor. He's here and he's on the platform with me today. He's the head of a large minority firm in Anne Arundel County that employs in his firm over 200 people. Happens to be very good at what they do. 
and he is the general contractor for our job, Maryland Live. It's the largest minority contract ever awarded on a casino in the United States. <laughs> Kevin, could you just stand up for one second and wave? We made some commitments and pledges that we're in the process of keeping as this Maryland Live gets built. And it's important that the kinds of things I'm talking about not just be done on Maryland Live, but be done in all of business. And we've pledged that minority banks will have an opportunity to participate in the financing of Maryland Live. And they're already in the mix talking with our other lenders. We pledged that minorities would get preference in how women, African Americans, Hispanic, that's already happening. We pledged as part of the building of Maryland Live certain other preferences. And I just want to make sure I haven't left any of them out. The one I want to mention finally is ownership. And this is something, it's fine that you have workers, construction, it's fine that you have workers in permanent jobs, it's fine that you have minorities having the opportunity to invest, but it's also important that you give minorities opportunities to have ownership in the permanent facility afterwards and forever. And that is also in the process of happening. Great. Let me close with the theme that I sort of started on, which is the aristocracy of merit, because that's the only aristocracy that should be allowed in this great country of ours. I'm getting an award today for doing what is in the self-interest of the Cordish company, the self-interest of David Cordish. We're hiring the best, we're partnering with the best. We've got the best workers. What religious background, minority background, female background they have is irrelevant. If I want to get the best job done, then what I should have is an aristocracy of merit, and that's what we're trying to achieve. And we don't deserve any award for that. That's good business. Thank you.